Hi there and welcome. You are listening to The Hoof of the Horse, a podcast dedicated to farriery and equine science with Dr. Simon Curtis. I'm here in West Sussex uh, on a cool and blustery early spring day uh, because later I'm going to be giving some lectures and demos uh, to farriers here at Total Foot Protection. So this has given me the opportunity to speak to Mark Spriggs, who was one of the directors of that company. We're going to talk to him about his life as a farrier and we're going to look at uh, some issues, for example, natural balance, shoeing, and uh, working on laminitics. Hello, Mark. Hi there, Simon. Nice to see you again. Yeah, you too. It's great to be down here. Um, so we're here in West Sussex. Just, just tell people, and remember, we have listeners from all over the world, where West Sussex is. West Sussex, where I live presently in a small village called Henfield, probably 15 minutes from Brighton, which is on the south coast, which is known as Little London by the Sea. So but I'm still in a pretty rural area. Okay, and we have lovely chalk downs, are they? Yeah, chalk downs, um, yeah, pretty unspoiled, actually. Now, I was, I was with you uh, all this morning, and uh, the main thing that you had to do was shoe a little laminitic case uh, that you, I think you've, you've looked after the horse for a long time, but it had an episode last year. And uh, can you tell us how that, uh, how that case progressed? Yes, well, he's a sweet little pony. Um, as Simon said, I've been shooting him for a very long time. He's always, he's a confirmed Cushing's pony. Um, client is very on board, managed him very well. But as you know, with all these little horse ponies, they're quite heartbreakers. You know, you, you're doing so well with them for a long period of time. And then they fall out of bed on you. And this uh, episode happened at the end of uh, last summer after a very dry period and uh, if the farriers certainly in the south of England know that the feet became extremely hard and very hard to actually exfoliate their soles. So on this little pony's um, shoeing cycle this particular time I went in and I think we'd had a little bit of rain and of course the sole just gave itself up and, and, and it you know just fell out the sole basically did. And I was quite astonished by the amount of foot this pony had got because actually when you looked at him from a sort of side, you know, lateral view, he didn't look particularly toey, you know. But anyway, proceeded in cutting his foot up, was pretty satisfied with what I'd done, shot him up as normal, seemed perfectly happy. Anyway, a couple of days later, the client comes on the phone, you know, saying he's been uncomfortable since, since I'd last shot him. And I thought, mm, you know pretty sure he was probably going to have a laminit, possibly been in a laminitic sort of phase, but, um, you know, he'd been so good for so long, and then you question, you know, have I got the shoe a bit tight on him, and so forth, and all the rest, but anyway, I went straight back out to him, and actually, yes, no, it was, it was very obvious in his stance, and the way he was stood, that, you know, he was in quite a serious state, and foundering quite big time. So I just got his shoes off and um, put some Equisoft pads on with some impression material in the back of the foot to try and stabilise the situation. And, you know, he was a whole lot more comfortable, you know, once I'd sort of got the weight off the front of his foot. And, you know, it was a long, long trek to get him right, actually. Well, I saw him this morning, and although we could still see the laminal wedge, he was a happy pony and he's and I forgot to say he's 30 years old so we're not yeah talking a youngster here and uh, certainly it looked to me like you'd sorted him out until the next episode I suppose really yeah I mean I, mean, I, I was very concerned about him because I'm actually very fond of him you know he's such a nice little pony to be around and uh, you know at one point we really thought we were going to lose him you know both me and the client have got a good relationship you know she actually said you know do you think it's time that we, you know, put him down? But we reassessed with the support system we had on him and adjusted that and actually got him comfortable and actually allowed him outside to have a little bit of, you know, ambient sort of exercise within a confined space. He could see his friend and, uh, 
you know, basically he was suffering from depression as much as anything. And actually for once we got him moving, you know, everything started to turn around. So after a period of time of having him in pads, we then moved on and got some clogs on him. And, and really from that point on, although I must actually reflect that Mr. Bit out there actually was that uh, it wasn't until very much later before I went to put the clogs on, you know, I'd realised he got solar, quite extensive solar abscesses on both front feet. So no wonder the poor little devil was struggling. But, um, you know, once we got the clogs on there, he hasn't looked back. No, as I say, he, it was uh, it's great to see a success story like that. And he looked very happy this morning. Yeah. And he shot another horse there as well, of course. And as you say, uh, one of the things that is sometimes forgotten that isn't all about what we do. You had, uh, or the pony had an owner who was absolutely dedicated to him, wasn't she? And, uh, yeah, and absolutely on board. You know, I think one of the biggest problems we have with these type of ponies is more often the client yeah. is, um, you know, I, I, you know, and I think sometimes. <laughs> You know, they potentially the problem lies with them, and they're you know they feel they're doing their animals well when they're feeding all the time, yeah. and as all farriers know, you know, kindness is the thing that kills these poor yeah. ponies. And yeah. uh, but to have somebody, she well, really lucky in this situation. The client will absolutely do what I tell her to do. Very sensible lady, you know, and also sensible enough to you know if if we had to have called it a day, we would have called it a day. Yeah. And sometimes that's what we have to do. All right. So moving on, I know um, you you were quite early into natural balance shoeing in this country, uh, if it's still called natural balance shoeing. But um, can you can you explain that process and how you got into it? Well, and, and your link with uh, Gene Ovnichek. Well, it all came about through my business partner David Nichols. Um, had been out to the states, I think, to one of the you know, big conventions out there, and he was actually presenting himself. And um, unfortunately for him, he watched Gene Ovnik's um, presentation, his early wild horse studies. And I think he sat there going, oh my God, you know, I've just seen this, and this is quite, uh, you know, totally changed my view on horseshoe, and how the hell am I gonna go on and um, give this presentation? Anyway, out of that friendship that Dave uh, built up with Gene Ovnik, he came over to the UK. I was very lucky, actually stayed here in my house each time he came over. And we went out and shot horses together when, you know, what a, what a privilege to be with, you know, one of the very, you know, leading um, sort of open minds of how to, you know, reassess the how to shoe horses. And, um, you know, for me, I, I, I find it, uh, a very practical way of shoeing horses and we found you know this was even prior to the hoof mapping at this point in time we were just drawing a line across the widest point of the foot and judging that to be the center point of articulation and, and you know shoeing around these points and uh, you know soon found that even sort of flat-footed um, thoroughbreds after a few shoeings of shoeing them in this way you started to get a much more uh, compact, solid foot with concavity coming to the sole. So well, I, I certainly, um, a lot of my thoroughbred broodmares, I shod with natural balance shoes. Not not the original ones, which were too big and clunky for, for thoroughbreds, but certainly the ones that came later. Um, but I noticed you had got some new shoes. Well, you've got some shoes that I've only seen from a distance today. And they are actually in the evolution a little bit further on from the early natural balance shoes, aren't they? Yes, I mean, I think what you're talking about is the Avanti, which has been yeah. out on the market for some time. Um, this was developed by um, developed in the state states uh, through EDSS and a, a chap by the name of Foxworth, who his wife had a warm blood, and um, you know he was struggling to keep this thing sound and I think there's nothing new with this shoe I think people have been welding you know round bar on the inner peripheries of a horseshoe um, you know to get these animals right and I mean it's sort of based upon the principles of what the you know we're all familiar with the clogs now that we use on laminitics and um, really what we're doing is we're bringing all the leverage forces away 
and shooing round the shooing round the pedal bone basically, and moving the horses you know weight more into the centre and taking the leverage away. And I think the 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 the, the biggest problem for our equines these days is leverage. You know, I mean, especially with uh, the pleasure horse and sports horse, whether it be a dressage, a venting, reining, or so forth, it's tight circles which are you know our horses have never been designed to do well and, and i know you and i agreed on something about that um you don't shoe with ridiculous length and width if i can put it that way you you obviously give them something to stand on um but you're not giving this additional uh, length and width which has become i think just a little bit of a trend yes yeah, so in this country i i, I think it, it it came back when shoeing was starting to change and we started talking about this magic rate ratio of 40 60 percent and that was before we really started to understand the mechanics of horses so therefore we was rather than thinking about the shoe placement in the toe we were adding the length to the heels to try and achieve this ratio well if anybody you know, as a, a practical fire issue in especially sports horses that are expected to move at speed, you know, this is a totally impractical way of shoeing horses. You might get away with it with dressage horses, but, you know, you soon get sick of going back to putting shoes back on, and I can assure you, clients get sick of it, especially if they're going off to an event, and, uh, you know, they're continuously pulling shoes off. So I, I feel the way that, you know, shoeing feet in a symmetrical way bringing the heels back we always used to talk about the widest point of the frog but it's bringing the heels back to the back of the foot and you know really you don't need to shoe any further than that i'm sure evolution if if a horse required an extra pad at the back of its foot it would have developed something like that and i think also if the agreement is to um a, a normal um gait um, of uh, what biomechanical needs is a horse is going to land slightly heel first um, it tends to land actually slightly lateral heel first and then onto the medial heel now if you go sticking uh, you know a vast amount of extra length your, your horse actually is prematurely impacting on the ground before it's ready for the loading phase so i, I really can't see that that is beneficial and actually what we're now in building in our shoes now is we're slumping the heels off like we used to do with the hunter shoe um, to actually give um, a break over for the heels or more of a roll in stance yeah. rather than um, you know the horse crashing down on, on a square shoe so, which I think is very important and certainly with laminitics if you give them a roll into their stride and then out that roll into their stride is just as beneficial as the break over going out. Yeah, and we can we see that that was done a hundred years ago. It's exactly. Bit, like, oh, <laughs> Nothing new. Come around in circles, <laughs> isn't it? A bit. Now, one thing I wanted to question you about, Mark, is that um, you you have actually had a long time in a farrier partnership, and that's a little bit unusual, isn't it? Farriers all over the world seem unable to form partnerships, and I've always said. Is it because we know more than doctors and dentists and architects? Um, but you, it appears to me that you've cracked it. So if you can tell us something about the Farrier partnership. Well, the, 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 the Farrier practice was born out of, in very early days, of um, David Nichols, my business partner, well, one of my business partners, um, moving into an area and, um, you know, my clients were winding up, well, you know, you've got a rival down the road. Anyway, I took it upon myself to go down and meet David and we had a lot in common and um, over a period of time, you know, we started covering for each other and helping each other out, you know, obviously to, when somebody was on holiday or if unfortunately you were off ill. And then we took it a bit further, you know, we, we talked about um, forming a partnership and we actually both had quite different work practices. You know, David worked for the weekends, I didn't. I had a young family, you know. All the things that made our two business models quite different. And I think in, from what I've seen where other people have tried to do this, where they've tried to sort of put all the money in together and all that, it doesn't work because 
it always rears its head, well, you do more than me and so forth. So taking money out of the equation, I would say is probably the route to success in running a Fowlery practice. Um, so on the basis of that, we, um, I think another guy like Mark Hobby came along who is actually now on Vancouver Island. He was one of the original partners and uh, Mike Williams. So there was four of us originally and then um, one of the guys went off, as I said, to Vancouver Island. So between three of you, if you've got one of you away, actually it's quite doable for you to cover each other's work. And then off the back of that, um, uh, Mike has trained two apprentices. I trained my son um, and they've become part of the practice. Um, and also there's Be Becky Mabbott, um, who was a good friend of um, Dave's. She joined the practice. She was the first um, non sort of um, employee based sort of person to come in. But it really works. You know, we've got seven farriers out there and, and you know, farrier, it, it can be a very lonely world. And just having sort of other people when you're feeling a bit sort of cornered over or struggling with a, a case or a client, it's so much easier when you can talk to somebody about it and share ideas. And even, you know, to the degree with, especially with David, having been such an expert in um, laminitics, it was probably more cost effective to get him to do, if you had a complicated case, to get him to do the horse than you to do it. Yeah. Well, that's, um, that, that's one part, uh, the farrier practice. And then, of course, you opened a supply business, which uh, by coincidence has the same initials, T. Yes. <laughs> uh, I wonder why you did that. The uh, um, total foot protection. So, so tell us something about total foot protection and how it came well, about and how that works. It sort of came about an accident. I mean, and, and none of us planned to have a wholesale business, but you know, you soon realise that the amount of um, uh, materials we were buying in, it was easier to have joint stock holding. And um, at that time, Brooks Lane Smithy were going then, so we were sort of... Uh, friendly with them so we almost were known almost as brooks lane smithy south you know we were stocking their shoes and um, and we used to run the business on our own but we soon quickly found to provide a good service um you know we had to employ somebody so we employed um, mike's wife who ran the shop and it's really gone from there you know and to the size of the business now i think i confidently would say that we're probably the largest independent um, Ferrari wholesaler and um, from our friendship with um, uh, Gene Ognick and his family which is um, EDSS um, we were, David was bringing over their products for his you know use within veterinary clinics himself so we started bringing over specialist products from you know from America and um, then we got involved in you know, shoe design, and we brought out the center fit shoe, which was a collaboration between ourselves, Gene Ognick, Mac Head from MNC, and you know, we brought out the you know these shoes. So it's um, and then you know the, the clocks and so forth. Mm -hmm. You know, we sort of basically we bring in all the specialist stuff, I and mean, we produce all the laminitic you know, support systems, styrofoam, and so forth. And I think, you know, we still are probably the dominant product. And on the market. I see you up at Beaver, the British Equine Veterinary Association Congress, and you have a stand there, don't you? So you, send, you sell to the veterinary we, profession. We, we haven't been at a Beaver for a good few years now because the veterinary industry has really changed now. Yeah. Um, whereas you used to see the partners from the practice mm. on the stand, they become quite big corporate organisations, some of these things, and they tend to have buyers that are, you know, tasked with getting the things in, and they don't necessarily understand the concept of um, new products. But I think by then, we've actually established ourselves well into the veterinary market, and um, we have quite a lot of vets, especially ring David up for advice and product advice. Um. Now, just to move tack a little bit, um, I don't know whether you'd want to talk about this. I mean, I, I was on the 
Harry's registration council for a while, <laughs> and so so have you been. But um, you you served, didn't you? Um, yeah, I, as a member for a while. I served um, three and a half years, as it turned out. Um, Apparently, I'm partially to blame for that. Part, yes, uh, you were that. partially to blame. A certain person had dropped out, and uh, they were in a bit of a state. So I went on to the council early. Um, no, I enjoyed it. You know, I, I, I certainly, um, it certainly was an education, and I also sat on the disciplinary committee. And I think it would be wrong to say that I enjoyed sitting on the disciplinary committee because it was actually very challenging to be impartial, um, especially when you're um, sort of judging people on something that you do. So that was quite an education, but I enjoyed it from the, that point of view of having a better grasp of how the legal world w worked. And um, I, I hope that we actually always gave people a very fair hearing. I'm sure you did, and I think it's worth saying that and, and using this opportunity to say to young farriers need to put themselves forward to do these sort of jobs don't they it's no good sitting back or booing from the sidelines you know you, you have to put something back in yourself don't absolutely you? absolutely because um you know i think farriery has suffered from a degree of apathy um for years i mean these positions that you take on the frc um, all right, you get paid for the day that you're, you attend, but I can assure you it goes nowhere near to um, compensating you for going out short, shoeing horses for a day. But there's also a lot of people, and I really you know, admire the people on the BFBA, who have put in considerable hours over the years, over the apprentice training you know, scheme and all the rest, and trying to drag our industry into a more professional and modern industry actually and, and you know you get a you get an awful lot of flack from people on the outside who will you know criticize you but there's very few of them that are prepared to stand up and um you know sit on the frc or these various yeah. committees you know and i think you know you can't sit in the background and complain about something unless you're prepared to actually put some put something back yourself. Yeah, I'm hundred percent with you, Mark. And and if everybody put themselves forward for a few years, we wouldn't have any problem, you know, getting getting these committees filled and what have you. But you and I do occasionally meet up in London uh, for. Um, something a little bit more social don't we yes you you sort of travel <laughs> two hours north and i travel two hours south and there we are often at a dinner in london celebrating the, the farriers and uh, and sometimes have a pint of beer in a pub oh well, just just a few you know <laughs> all to discuss business yes um now something um i i sort of learned about you recently is that you you have over the years i'm not sure if you what what it how much of a connection it is now, but you've had a connection with the German-speaking uh, countries, haven't you, with, with barriers in yeah. Germany? Yes, bizarrely. I mean, I, I, um, I must be nearly 20 years ago, uh, there was a guy by the name of Joseph Luber who used to have a big show in, called Luvex in Bavaria. And I mean, in, in its heyday, I think they had over 650 people from all over Europe. I mean, just a phenomenal affair. And um, they were wanting Gene Omick to come over and speak. Gene couldn't speak. David couldn't speak. So Muggins here sort of got pushed to the front. And um, I can assure you, giving presentations is not my forte. But anyway, I put together a slideshow and um, a dear friend of mine now, Oliver Erica, who's a very accomplished farrier himself, um, translated. And he's a big, huge um, German guy, you know, and there was me, and I mean, I'm not exactly small, but I mean, he dwarfed me. And I think we very much looked like Laurel and Harley, you know, double act. Um, but from that, you know, I've been going backwards and forwards to Germany for the last 20 years. Um, both me and David and Jean Ovnik have done various clinics over there, built up some great friendships through 
Austria and Germany and, and into Holland itself as well. Um, but also we, as a wholesale business, we um, sell into the German market via Andreas Strong, who I would say probably is the largest, um, again, independent wholesaler in the world, actually. Mm. Just a phenomenal amount of stuff. But um, out of that, I have tried to learn <laughs> to speak German. <laughs> I have a German lesson every Monday, but uh, um, I'm very long way off from being able to speak German, but I certainly understand a lot more that's going on. Right, we're we're going to test your oh, German. No. <laughs> we're going to test your German, because I would like you to say, Sir, if your horse doesn't stand still, I cannot shoe it. Can you do that in German? No, I'm very sorry. Oh, oh man. <laughs> I could probably come out with some German expletives, but I don't no, think we're, we're suitable for this. So, no. how long have you had these every Monday lessons? I've been doing it for nearly two and a half years, and, and, and the problem is it's an extremely grammatic language. I'm dyslexic, and um, I struggle with English, so why I ever thought I was going to be able to speak German. But the thing is, I think if, <laughs> if I worked in Germany, and yeah. certainly when I'm over in Germany, and especially I've had a few German beers, uh, my fluency in German actually very much is improved. I think it, what it comes from is being shy, actually. And, and what I need to do is speak yeah. in German, really. And, and, it's, um, and also the problem when you're dealing with a technical aspect of like Farrery or any kind of technical um, language it's you know I can easily go into a restaurant or into a hotel or ask directions in German and will understand it but when it comes down to you know asking for sort of the anatomy and explaining the, the biomechanics benefits of our shoe in German I'm afraid and I, I, that's very difficult. I think I can go as far as I know that clubfoot is bock <laughs> yeah. And that's my lot, really, in German. Yeah. Um, now, you and I, Mark, are the same age. We're 62. Uh, we've been showing about the same... 42, 43 years now, I think. 43. Well, I'm a couple of years ahead of you. I got, I got kicked out of school earlier than you. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, you're relatively fit. You're still showing. Yeah. Uh, how do you account for that? Um... I, th I think I've, I've been very fortunate to be in a fairly secure financial position um, with the wholesale business. It provides me with a small income um, and I don't have a mortgage, which is great these days. So I don't, and all my kids have grown up. I've done all the university thing with them. But I think, um, I think it's sort of um, charging the right sort of money for your work, actually. Yeah. Uh, no, so you, therefore you don't have to compete on numbers don't compete on numbers I can't compete on numbers I just can't do it anymore but you know I do seem to have still some kind of reputation certainly within the dressage world um, that are able to keep animals relatively sound so you know I, th I think farriers sell themselves very short on their perceived value what you know they are to their clients yeah. And I think certainly in the environment that we are with at the moment of, you know, economic downturn, but also the Farrowy populace being probably the highest it's ever been for many, many years, that, you know, it's come extremely competitive out there. And, uh, and as a young farrier these days starting out, you know, I have every sympathy for them. Mm. But I think all the, how I see it, and this might be a simplistic way of doing it, is that the age-old thing that we're all stuck with it is it's all about how many horses we can do rather than actually doing less horses for more money. And I think until that mentality goes out of the industry, which actually, sadly, I don't think it ever will. You know, I don't think the lot for farriers will improve, but I think it's very much up to the individual to make that decision to you know you, you know you have to market yourself you have to educate yourself you have to do cpd you know and and you know be progressive and open-minded in the way you're going to shoot horses well usually at this point i ask my victims uh what is the most important thing they've learned 
in their life. But I think you've actually told us something very important that you've learned about Farrier, and that is to charge enough, and then when you get to our age, uh, you're not worried about how you're going to get through the day because of your back, because you're still trying to shoe eight horses a day. Absolutely. You know, I, I couldn't think of anything more daunting now. I mean, I, as I said to Simon earlier today, you know, I can remember exactly where I was on the piece of road driving and thinking to myself, do you know what? I've had enough of this, you know, doing six, seven, eight horses a day, you know, and, and you get to... 45 50 you're starting to struggle yeah. and and you know i recommend to any farrier is to sort of think about you know your future because you know we're all pretty fragile at the end of the day and we do break and i think you need to have a backup plan i mean when i came into the industry i actually did the aef course which was the agricultural engineers and farriers course up at hereford you know, we did a broad spectrum of subjects, you know, from raw, raw time, decorative iron work, to industrial blacksmithing, welding, machine shop, agricultural engineering. I, and I know those industries have really changed in their ways, but I suppose what I'm trying to say to other farriers, other farriers now, who's starting to get perhaps into their middle age, and I say middle age are probably around 35, 40, is that you need to start thinking about possibly developing another skill yeah another another income another stream. income stream absolutely yeah, that's, i would say i'd have to say all the smart farriers i've met yeah they, they do try and develop another way in the middle stages and, of their career and think about your pension you know i think the the problem for young farriers is you come out from being an apprentice all of a sudden you know, you've got all this money in your pocket and, you know, you, you, you think you, you live the high life and you, you want this and want that. But, you know, and I've done that as well myself. But, you know, I've put my money into property and, you know, ended up at the end of the day with no mortgage and probably sort of equity rich and cash poor. But, you know, I'd much rather be there that I, like I am now than still got a mortgage that I've got to pay until I'm 70. So... And, and you're, you're here in the rich part of um, England, so certainly property prices, uh, they certainly cost down here. Now, Mark, um, it's been fantastic speaking to you. As always, we always have some fun, and uh, uh, I'm sure we'll keep on meeting up quite regularly. I want to thank you for your words of wisdom, telling us about your life, and it's been a great privilege for me to interview you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Simon. <laughs> Thanks, mate. You can follow more of Simon's work on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. To get in contact, email thehoofofthehorse at gmail.com or if you're interested in Simon's books, please go to curtisfarrierbooks.com. Thanks for listening.